This is Jason Anderson, Chairman of the Colony Town Council, and I am calling this regular Town Council meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, February 14th, and it is currently 7.02 p.m. Mr. Wood, if you could. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you seeking your wisdom and your guidance as we go about the business of this, your town. Uh, we ask that we would be of one heart and one mind, uh, and we would honor you and honor those who uh, we serve. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. For roll call purposes, all council members are in attendance. We'll now move on to item 5A, adoption of minutes of previous meetings, special town council meeting, January 3rd, 2023, and 5B, regular town council meeting, January 10th, 2023. Can I get a motion to adopt these? I'll, I'll second. Ask. Motion's been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Wood. Discussion or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 6A, presentations, proclamations, and declarations. Killingly Parks and Rec Volunteer of the Year Award. Uh, Ms. Wakefield would actually like to yes. read the proclamation. Killingly Parks and Recreation, proclamation honoring the 2022 Volunteer of the Year. Whereas the Killingly Parks and Recreation programs are an integral part of our community, while Scott DeRosia has run many seasons of Killingly Youth Basketball programs as a per diem staff member, Scott took a different role for the 21-22 Youth Hoop season. Scott moved to a complete voluntary role in assisting the department to organize, referee, provide coaching assistance to the many volunteer coaches. Scott contributed more than 80 plus volunteer hours to the Killingly Youth Basketball Program during a very challenging basketball season. Whereas the youth hoop would not be possible without the tremendous number of volunteer coaches and individuals like Scott DeRosier, Scott's youth program's ex expertise has a tremendous impact on the positive experiences for our volunteer coaches, players, parents, seasonal per personnel. Scott leads with an example and is quick to help coordinate, officiate, facilitate within the program. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly, recognizing Scott DeRosier as the recipient of the 2022 Volunteer of the Year Award for the Killingly Parks and Recreation Department, be it further proclaimed that the Killingly Town Council urges all citizens to see how they can help their community by volunteering their time and knowledge. Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 14th day of February 2023. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I just want to take an opportunity um, to, to thank Scott for his many, many years of service, um, not only for our community, but for the staff at Kennelly Parks and Recreation. Um, without Scott's knowledge and expertise, 
um, the level of programming that we have would not be possible. Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes time and energy um, that Scott has put into our program, sometimes in a paid position and sometimes in a completely non-paid position. And it wasn't any more evident than the uh, 21 to 22 time frame. Um, Scott had stepped away from our program, um, came back in a volunteer role, um, and during a pandemic, of all things, um, volunteering is time to jump in and help us with coaching, uh, helping us with putting the teams together. Um, and I, j I just want to say thank you so much for what you do for this community. Um, and um, if you want to say anything really quick, um, I'll give you the mic. <laughs> no, I love having a microphone. So. <laughs> I promise not to sing. Uh, but anyway, I just want to say that, you know, for what I've been able to do in my life working with young kids, and I get probably more out of it than they do, but with the Killing Parks and Recreation Department, they've been absolutely fantastic with letting me, you know, fill my dreams, uh, letting me do things the way that I believe they should be done, and, and they have been giving me the freedom to do that. And, uh, and without their help, an everyday assistant, and we must have passed along maybe 30 or 40 emails a day back and forth with everybody in the staff there. Just a wonderful organization. And it goes back to uh, my dad working with the Kill and Rec de de uh, Parks and Rec Department, which he did, and that family that it has always been. So uh, I just want to thank you all and thank the Kill and Parks and Recreation Department. Good evening. I just want to say really quick that um, I think the town of Killingly should be proud. Um, we are very blessed to have an individual like Scott who has been in this community his entire life and has really dedicated himself to the youths of Killingly. And it's quite evident, like I said, I've been here. Um, I was in the department in the 90s and Scott was a huge mentor. To me, um, even in the professional field, uh, in teaching me, um, whether it was in coaching or just in my profession, um, and because of him, um, I'm probably back here now, um, and, and it's, it's just awesome to see uh, an individual who's done so much for the community, and I think the town of Kinley should be proud of him and blessed that we have him, and we hope that he continues for a long time to come so thank you guys on behalf of the entire council I would like to thank you um, it's rare that we find people who are willing to give to the community um, and volunteer so much of themselves um, it takes away a lot from your own time um, and, and it's a dedicated service and we appreciate everything you've done now we'll move on to the agenda. Next item up is 6B, proclamation recognizing the week of February 18th through the 25th is National FFA Week. And Ms. Wakefield wanted to read this as well. As, as my children, two of my children graduated from the Ag Ed program, um, I have a little soft spot for FFA, so. Uh, proclamation recognizing National FFA Week, February 18th through the 25th, 2023. Whereas the FFA and agriculture education programs provide a strong foundation for the youth of America and the future of the food, fiber, and natural resource systems, and whereas FFA promotes a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success among its members, and whereas agriculture education in FFA ensures a steady supply of young professionals to meet the growing needs science, business, and technology of agriculture, and whereas the FFA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve, gives direction of purpose to these students who take an active role in succeeding in agriculture education, and whereas FFA promotes volunteerism, citizenship, patriotism, and cooperation, 
And now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Killingly Town Council that the week of February 18th to the 25th, 2023, be recognized as FFA Week. Killingly Town Council Jason Anderson Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, the 14th day of February 2023. Thank you, Ms. Wakefield. Next item up is 6C. Oh. Thank you for supporting the Killingly FFA chapter and celebrating National FFA Week with us. The National FFA organization helps recognize and develop student leadership roles. Through agriculture education, our chapter is committed to providing all students with a path to achievement in premier leadership, personal growth, and career success. Within the Killingly FFA program, students have many opportunities to develop skills and explore their interests in a broad range of agriculture pathways. Whether those interests are in farming, becoming a veterinarian, a horticulturist, a mechanic, a scientist, or an entrepreneur, among many more options. Thank you for recognizing the importance of agriculture in our daily lives and the value of the leadership skills our students are developing through the National FFA organization. Thank you. Now we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is 6 if I may, Mr. Chairman, the next two items are supposed to be for February of 2023. So when you go through the agenda, we're making that correction, but the actual proclamations do list 20, February 2023. Okay. Yep. So we have, there is a correction. If anyone is looking at our agenda, the proclamations say February of 2022. They're actually for February of 2023. Item 6C is a proclamation recognizing the month of February 2023 as Black History Month in the town of Killingly. Whereas Black History Month is observed annually across the United States in February, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by African Americans to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. And whereas in 1915, Dr. Carter Goodwin Woodson, a noted historian and author, second African American to earn a PhD from Harvard University, founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which was later renamed the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And whereas Dr. Woodson initiated Black History Week on February 12, 1926, and for many years, the second week of February, chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, has been celebrated by African Americans in the United States. And whereas in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially declared Black History Month as part of the nation's bicentennial. Black History Week was expanded and became established as Black History Month and is now celebrated all across North America. And now, therefore, the Killingly Town Council does hereby proclaim the month of February 2023 as Black History Month, which is a time for honoring the significant achievements, inspirations, and contributions African Americans have made to our town, state, and nation. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 14th day of February 2023. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is item 6D, proclamation recognizing the month of February 2023 as Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month in the town of Killingly. Whereas Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Awareness Month is a national effort to raise awareness about the abuse in teen and young adult relationships and promotes programs to prevent this abuse during the month of February. And whereas teen dating violence is a widespread problem affecting youth in every community across the nation. 
and whereas one in three young people are affected by physical, sexual, or verbal dating violence, one in ten in a serious relationship have reported being slapped, pushed, hit, threatened, or coerced by their partner, and recognizing breakups are a time of greater risk even when a relationship was never physically abusive. And whereas young people can choose better relationships when they understand that healthy relationships are based on respect and learn to identify early warning signs of an abusive relationship. And whereas elimination of dating violence must be achieved through cooperation of individuals, organizations, and communities, and young people across the nation have organized to put a stop to dating abuse and work alongside their adult allies to educate young people about this violence. And whereas Dating Violence Prevention Awareness Month provides an excellent opportunity for citizens to learn about preventing dating violence and to show support for the numerous organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy, services, and assistance to victims. Now, therefore, the, town the Killingly Town Council does hereby proclaim the month of February 2023 as Dating Viol Violence Prevention and Awareness Month in the town of Killingly. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 14th day of February 2023. Next item up on the agenda is unfinished business for town meeting action, and we have none, so we'll move on to item eight, citizen statements and petitions. Ms. Colorio, did we have anything submitted? We did not receive any. Thank you. At this time, if anyone would like to speak, please come up to the podium and state your name and address. Good evening, Donna Bronwell here from Bailey Hill up in East Killingly and chair conservation for oh, at least 20 years. A um, couple of things, good to be here. I haven't been here in a little while. Um, some things that are happening with the Conservation Commission. Um, next month at the council meeting here, we'll present our uh, environmental award. Um, the other, another thing we're doing is the Last Green Valley has established a spring outdoors uh, time that is similar to the Walktober where they have the whole month that there are all kinds of activities around the uh, town they're mo they're also doing that in spring outdoors so highlighting um, events from March to June and they're going to actually present make a, a, a brochure a printed brochure for the spring they never did that before it used to be just online but this year they're doing it uh, with a uh, printed brochure so <laughs> what we've done um, is uh, we said, well, gee, we should do some walks and things like that for conservation. And in light of that, some of the, we have a number of new people on conservation. Thank you, God. <laughs> we only have one. <laughs> it's been a while, I'll tell you, it's been a while. We, d we do still have one um, alternate position open. So if anybody here is talk, uh, talks about um, conservation environment all that good stuff send them our way we always welcome everybody that's great um, but a number of our new people as we talk about these our various uh, properties that we have somebody some of them said well I've heard of that but I don't know where it is and uh, so anyhow uh, we organized a um, a special meeting on a Saturday and got a bus um, from the town and a driver and we went around to a lot of our properties and people said, oh, this is where that is. Oh, I see what you mean and all that kind of stuff. So it was a kind of a tour around on Saturday morning to um, show people on the commission, uh, you know, where our properties were. Some of them were not familiar. <coughs> so that was a good thing. As a result of that, we decided to have uh, for this uh, Last Green Valley spring outdoors time from March to June, to do uh, four walks at our various properties, and we'll probably do one bus tour also. Um, we've got to affirm that tomorrow night, but that's probably what's going to happen. So it, it, we're back on track, going to be highlighting our great places in town. Um, so the, we still have one opening, um, and our meeting is tomorrow night. Everybody's welcome. We're always open to visitors anybody we have fun <laughs> so that's my story thank you Donna would anyone else like to make public comment last call for public comment 
Seeing no further public comment, we will move on on the agenda. Next item up is council and staff comments. I was just wondering when uh, we were going to have the, uh, the economic development discussion again that was on, like, will that be on the agenda again in terms of, uh, so what I was thinking when I heard that is um, that it seems like the benefit of the large grant that they're going for is for the entire town, not just for the wastewater plant. So uh, why would the wastewater be plant? doing be doing the entirety of the funding for it anyways it may not be a discussion for tonight <laughs> you know the sixty thousand dollar feasibility study uh, but like, when will that be on again um, so um, the WPCA will be um, evaluating funding the um, feasibility study yeah. um, at their upcoming uh, meeting which I believe is next week because um, <clears throat> I think they're they might have some revised numbers for that um, so I don't know that it's 60,000 anymore it might be at a revised number um, um, so the WPCA would look to fund that out of their out of their capital project funding but it seemed like a to me it seemed like a town initiative of uh, what did you call it uh, three towns initiative to get the grant so it's not just so um, typically the uh, because the wastewater treatment plant is uh, fully funded by user rates um, all capital projects are also funded by those user rates and so that's where the WPCA funds all their capital projects unless the town decides to participate in a um, larger capital investment in the in the project um, but typically um, the for studies like that that's usually handled by the WPCA because it uh, is specifically uh, it's an enterprise fund so it's uh, funded entirely large, by the user rates to get the large grant and so they're going to get all of the grant and the town doesn't get any of correct that grant then? Okay. right so it goes strictly to that's the plant their benefit then is they it's get the, the plant grant. right and is that joint with the housing grant no so totally separate. Completely separate. Okay. All right. Com two separate, complete things. Yeah, I was <laughs> unclear about their incentive to do fund that entire thing, thinking it seemed like coming from the town. Uh, but no, if they're getting the whole grant, if they get the whole grant. Correct. That's their incentive. It's a com so. Yeah, two complete separate things. So Mary, is that a potential increase for their customers or no? Um, um, if no, they're, they're funding that, or is it already in their? They have funding? capital. They, they have, have capital, capital funding that. that they okay. already have. They're looking to to get authorization to use that capital money that they already have for oh, okay. that purpose. So it's so not. So it would go towards that feasibility study. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, WPCA, you have your joint meeting with WPCA next month. Okay. Any further comments, Mr. Wood? <laughs> Just real quick on what Ms. Bromwell said, you know, I'm just more excited to see how, uh, you know, c having now come out of COVID, how well you guys are doing. And also, we're more than happy to try to recruit people as much as we can for you. I know I, I bring that up every every time we have a town committee meeting there for the Republicans, and I'm sure the Democrats, they do the same thing. So, uh, and all of us know a lot of people in town, so we're doing our best. We'll keep trying for you, Donna. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Grandowski. comments <laughs> uh, we're not letting you off that easy <laughs> all right we'll move, move on in the agenda next item up is 10 appointments to boards and commissions we had none this month um, moving on further next item up is 11 a uh, Board of Education liaison mr. Napper <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> 
Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Sorry it's been a little while. Uh, but anyways, I'll just give you an update on the last meeting uh, and a few other things were going on. This past meeting, did some basic housekeeping, and then there was uh, discussion and discussion and on school facilities requests. So, uh, when other outside entities request to use the gyms or the uh, auditorium and such, we're going to review those processes and, and what's involved. Because I guess there was a bit of an overflow at one event and at the uh, central office and there were not many people at the gymnasium event up at the high school so we're going to look at the policies and so forth that that, that process is and uh, they've been there for a little while so we're going to revisit them um, on the superintendent's update last week there were a couple of administrator vacancies um, the principal at the high school we have an interim at the time and so we're interviewing or taking applications for a permanent uh, replacement there and then there was a an assistant for the pupil services uh, director on the administrative side uh, on facilities for the projects we're working on right now some HVAC systems we're working on with the town as far as getting some funding um, also working with the town on engineering services, just trying to streamline things for that. And then the water system at the high school uh, is, uh, they're uh, looking for a new operator for the water system running the high school water system right now. So I believe that walkthrough is this week um, and then bids are due. And so that, that's in the works right now. We also had a, a discussion and we approved a sick bank request for a staff member that's going to be out for an extended period. Um, we are in full budget swing mode right now. Our next meeting is tomorrow evening, uh, 6.15 at central office. I believe most of the budget meetings are going to be at the central office location, not here. Um, and that they're all scheduled for 6:15 at this point. It's every other week, and then our regular meetings are every other week. Um, we are also interviewing um, for ASO positions. We've had three interviewees so far, I believe. Is that correct, Ms. Gloria? Uh, we've had we've had two interviewees. Uh, we have um, uh, we've had another applicant submitted. Okay. We've uh, reposted the position in a number of um, additional. Um, outlets um, again we initially posted that position those positions I should say right before Christmas so it's really not surprising that we didn't see a lot of submittals right at that Christmas time frame so we've uh, you know kind of re recast the net again mm. um, so we have two in the hiring process right now yeah we're excited to see that process is moving forward yes so um, and that was it for this past meeting so um, that's my update any questions? The um, gas, natural gas hookup to the high school, has that been completed yet? It has not. Um, there was some hold up with that, and it's still in the works. Uh, I can double check and see where they're at right now. I believe they were waiting for the actual pad and the meter set up. I think it slowed down on the bridge coming o over 395. Yeah, that was a holdup, right? That was a long, real snafu there. And then, uh, so now they're waiting for the meter pad on the other side of that. And so I believe we've had to go out and purchase oil. And of course, we didn't have a great rate locked in anywhere. So I can't give you a specific on that, but I'm mm -hmm. sure it was not. Pretty it enjoyable. No. <laughs> uh, so the natural gas, it's still in the works. And the last we heard, they were just waiting for that, that final step. Um, and, you know, contractors and parts and materials, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Now, once the connection is made, um, is the boiler or any updates that are needed at the school already done, or will that have to be done after? I, uh, I believe that they have to be done after because they're waiting for the gas. So it's one of those deals you can't put the
the cart before the horse and and uh, so yeah there and uh, so the high school and uh, over at KCS I believe are both they're ready but they'll have to be converted thank you it's just the burner in the in the boiler so it's not replacing the whole system it's just the burner and they'll probably change it to a dual to a dual fuel burner um, it's and they have to do it at the same time that they're actually making the gas connection so it'll happen at the same time thank you so can I have a question so I don't know if this would be to Kyle or Mary so for next year how would that work for locking in would would you do that or would they be responsible for that and when would they have that on their time frame yeah so for our natural gas um, they typically have locked in independently of the town we haven't um, we we don't have a huge demand on that um, sometimes we've worked together on that I can um, re go over what those uh, I think we've used the CCM procurement process in the past as well for um, natural gas lock-in um, for heating fuel for um, heating oil um, we did not include them in the lock-in this oh, okay. last year that's because, what I was referring to so. yeah we didn't include yeah. them because we it was anticipated that they were going to be actually connected back yep. in like the fall Mm -hmm. And so we didn't, that, that is a large consumption of oil. And so if we had included them and they did actually start with the natural gas, then we would have had a huge buyout gotcha. of um, heating oil for that contract. So we did not include them in the contract for oil this last time around. And we would, again, not include them upcoming right. because Until the assumption is that this is going to take, like, so we have that conversation with them. So the anticipation is that they'll get up and running on natural gas, but okay. Um, so we did not. That's why they've kind of been out on the spot market for um, heating oil. I guess on the bright side, it has been a milder winter this year. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Wood. Just with the um, water uh, service, mm -hmm. what, what exactly – I don't know how much you can comment on, like, what exactly happened there. I, I know well, there was a little bit of a Winnie article that didn't really explain too much of it, so. I, I'm not 100% sure. There, there was an operator that was out of Rhode Island, um, and they stopped servicing Connecticut. Um, they, in, in turn, had an interim person that they dealt with on a somewhat <coughs> regular basis. Um, he filled in and now i guess they're they're out there looking for a a, a more permanent situ uh, yeah. you know answer yeah so we have a, they have an interim water operator right now right. that is um filling in however um we the previous operator in accordance with our um requirements with the, with the state department of drinking water we're supposed to have um a remote monitoring system on there the previous operator removed that technology out of there it was their technology they removed it out mm -hmm. so an incoming operator is going to have to reinstall that technology um, we've been in regular conversations so uh, our Dave Cap, our engineer has been working with the State Department of drinking water as well as Board of Education staff um, in coordinating the RFP for this um, that's in my manager's report as well so this will cut down some of my manager's report um, information, we're, just so we're you know. We're really working on cutting down. <laughs> we're cutting tonight. that down. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the interim one, um, he is uh, meeting the requirements at this point, but uh, for the long haul, it's not likely a permanent solution. So we need to get a per to a permanent long-term operator contract that the Board of Ed can enter into. So we have that RFP on the streets. Um, the Board of Ed uh, staff, they were just, they don't, that's an RFP like that isn't something that they do on a regular basis and managing contractors like that isn't something that they necessarily handle on a regular basis which is why we offer to assist on the on the town engineer side and walk it through on our side as well and make that assist so um, it's kind of gotten out on the street pretty quickly um, Dave and Mike and Bob have you know they've all worked really closely together in making sure we address um, the existing needs and any um, upcoming needs. Um, the walkthrough, I think, is Thursday, and then they'll have the bid opening um, for it. So hopefully we'll get a good turnout for potential operators on that system. And thank you for coming out, Kyle. Sure. Contract.
contract? No, we got a 90 day notice. I believe we did get appropriate notice according yes. to contract. Okay, but still, that's a tough, that's tough to run that system. Right, but the contractor, when they exited, they did, a, they did provide appropriate notice under their contract. So, so what's happening with the monitoring thing? Like, do we have one on there right it's, now? It's manually being mon monitored. Oh. So they're going down manually and monitoring. Um, so th and the state is aware um, of that situation. And they're aware of the steps that we're taking to um, move back into that remote 24-hour um, monitoring. And um, so we're, um, they understand the process <laughs> that we're going through. Depending on the level of treatment that's in exactly. the system, it requires remote uh, monitoring and and so yeah. they fell in under that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Apparata, thank you for joining us this evening. Moving on in the agenda, we'll move on to the next item, which is 11B Borough Council Liaison. Um, not not much going. Um, we're continuing work on our website, um, it's slow but surely, surely. Um, that kind of mo it almost sounds like their, their water issue, it just takes all the, all, every time you move a little further you find more bumps and, and, and oopsies. Um, so the truck's been ordered, um, you should be getting, that's, well, as, as soon as they can get us the truck. Um, and just everything's moving along. Our, our borough uh, elections and uh, the charter revision is we're moving along. So things are progressing. Thank you. Moving on on the agenda, next item up is item 12A, discussion and acceptance of monthly budget reports. Uh, can I get a motion to accept the summary report on general fund appropriations for town government? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Ms. George, seconded by Mr. Grandelsky. Questions, comments, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? <coughs> Motion carries. We'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is 12B, discussion and acceptance of monthly budget reports. Can I get a motion to accept the system object based on adjusted budget for the Board of Education? Make the motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Ms. George. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to item 13, uh, correspondence communication reports, the town manager's report. Okay. Um, so um, as indicated at, at your last week's meeting when you met with the Economic Development Commission, um, we did, we are the recipient of the Yukon Tabs Municipal Assistant Program again this spring, and that is for the Bailey Hill Mill site. They're going to be starting the um, evaluation of that site to determine any possible contamination and identify any previous remediation efforts that might have been conducted on the site. So this is really that first step into kind of really fi figuring out what's the holes and the gaps and understanding where are the challenges with that site so that site can start to begin to progress into um, potentially redevelopment at some point in time. So I, they actually were out uh, tail end of last week or was it yesterday might have been yesterday they were out I think it was yesterday they were out yesterday um, so they started looking at the site they went out and did a site visit yesterday so they're already beginning that process so it's great this is our second mill site that has been chosen for this and there's you know this program um, there were only about um, seven projects that were selected for this pro for this pro um, program so um, Jill did a really great job in um, writing that grant application and that proposal to get it submitted into here and this program getting the project submitted under this program typically the ones that get into this program um, uh, 
have a better um, uh, better availability into moving forward and progressing into phase two environmentals and getting grant funding um, at other levels. So um, <clears throat> we've been successful with the Bailey with the Blueville Mill in progressing that one forward under another um, uh, grant funding option. Uh, so we're hoping that that would progress forward for Bailey Hill Mill as well. So it's great to start to see that momentum moving forward. We met with Frontier with regards to the fiber project. So as with most of the communities around here, they're rolling out fiber across the state. So I did incorporate in your package their PowerPoint presentation that they presented to us. Um, we did uh, we did get to view the map that um, where they're developing where they're going to be rolling out. They don't share that. That is uh, uh, their um, proprietary information, so they don't distribute that. But essentially, where they're rolling it out will pretty much provide coverage throughout all of Killingly. So we really anticipate getting um, full cover. Frontier anticipates having coverage throughout Killingly. In the PowerPoint presentation, it does incorporate or include in, in there what they are presenting to potential subscribers for rates, for residential rates. So you can see what um, the two packages, if you will, that they're kind of offering is towards the very end of their presentation. It also does uh, provide pictures of what their aerial fiber hubs are going to look like, the little boxes that are going to be on the telephone poles. We did walk through that and talk through that in great detail, especially with regards to any impacts from winter weather, rain weather, that type of stuff. There's really nothing in there that can get damaged by the wind, by the by the rain or, or snow. Um, they also put it on the protected side, if you will, of the of the telephone pole. So it does have lesser possibility of damage. But again, they are very accustomed to this rollout and this design, and um, have this in many areas that have you know frequent snow. So they um, were cognizant of our concerns. But again, um, there doesn't seem to be any concern from a public safety standpoint. Um, and they're also putting it on the protected side. So this rollout is going to really start in the spring. And it's going to take a few months for them to complete it. Um, it does have phone numbers in here for individuals that you can call and find out when they think service is going to be coming through. Or you can go on to Frontier's website and try and see, um, just keep tabs of when service might be available in your area if you want to check out what pricing might be for your home and for your residents. Um, the next topic that I included for you was an update or information with regards to Chase Reservoir. So Chase Reservoir, we have a number, we have hiking paths that are around Chase Reservoir. And um, this property really kind of came to my attention. Um, I will say uh, my staff brought uh, mentioned it to me really closely, um, like around the fall time frame, that conservation has really been talking about needing to do um, forest management plan on here, but that there was a fair amount of uh, damaged and diseased trees on this property right after the windstorm at Christmas. Um, I made a point of going out there to um, visit the property. There is pretty severe damage on the property. There's a lot of down trees um, actually right now. I walked the property just a few weeks ago and um, the trail itself, there's about six areas that it's completely blocked. I'm talking, you know, it's not just one tree, it's you know, four or five trees that are down all kind of stuck together or there may be two trees that are across the trail and then there's one tree that's kind of hung up and stuck. The trail also is um, is very wet. You can actually see in some of the pictures um, what looks like mud spots but it's actually water running um, through the trail. So the ground is too soft right now for us to really bring equipment in to really cut o re cut open those trails. So we're monitoring that to see when we can actually bring in equipment to actually cut re cut open the trails. That being said, um, <clears throat> we did reach out to Connecticut Deep. They have a forestry program that can provide consultation services um, up to eight hours per year. They only come out for eight hours in a year. 
on one property. So um, they came out, the forester did come out, he evalu- they, the forester evaluated the conditions and they provide a written report. So we did just, very end of last week, we did receive the report. I haven't had a chance to really go through that report, but i am be meeting with staff to go over what his recommendations were in that report. And our intentions are is to use that report as a platform to creating an RFP to um, hire a forester to develop a forest management plan for the property. Um, we have concerns about the um, amount of um, uh, dead trees that are on the property um, for a number of reasons. One, for public safety, um, the proximity of a lot of them to the actual trail pathway. I did check what the town's liability might be around that. And as for any trail or any open space property, anybody going onto a trail, they do assume a level of risk. So the town is protected under um, recreational uh, recreational immunity. So um, individuals, you know, um, do assume a certain level of risk when they go hiking on a trail. Um, but that being said, it's going to be very difficult to maintain that trail open with the amount of just dead and dying trees that are right in such close proximity. Also, with the amount of um, dead wood that has fallen, when you drive down Pratt Road, you can actually see over by the boat launch area, it actually almost looks like a mo- microburst went through. Like if you were to look through there, it would actually look like a microburst. It, it, they're just laid flat. Um, through there. There's so much dead stock that's down on the ground right now that there is concern that if we have another severe drought time, fr- time frame that they, there's also a heavy fire load that's on the ground as well. So um, the forest management plan will help us identify what are our steps to move forward in addressing that property and bringing it to a better health, right? So we can still maintain it as a, as a passive recreational property. So that's the intent for that property. So I did give you a number of pictures um, of, of that property, mostly around the trails, trail areas. Um, if anybody wants to walk the property or see what it looks like, um, you can get a good sense of it by just driving down the dirt area of Pratt Road. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty obvious from the roadway. But if anybody wants to walk the trail, let me know. We'll gladly take you down the trail and walk down the trail. But you're going to start to see some additional signage go up just to remind people that they're passing at their own risk, that they need to make sure. There are, there are signs up there that say that, but we are going to probably put some more signage up just to remind people they need to be cautious about where they're walking and to be mindful um, of their surroundings. Um, Edi Prey Reservoir Dam. So... Uh, that you yeah, I believe you got I f- meant to include the picture in with the packet and apparently I must have missed it so you I believe you got that separately yes there's two pictures one above the water that shows the funnel one below the water and if you were to go out there today and all you're going to see is a hole now because the water has drained right so the bathtub is drained out um, <clears throat> so we received a uh, notice from the property owner wish uh, the dam owner wish that um, they were experiencing excessive water that was coming underneath the dam through the dam and that um, there was concerns about the whether or not the road was going to be impacted so we've had the road closed throughout this entire duration Um, the the water is now down to that um, the whole area that you see on that picture of the underwater it's now down to that area the property owner um, uh, the dam owner owner wish they are in communication with deep they have to develop a remedy or a solution that is approved by deep on how to handle this um, the approach that they're taking at this moment is their intent was to get to essentially the level that they're at right now which is the water has drained to that um, to the bottom of the dam which is essentially where that hole is at the bottom of the dam they will now breach the dam and essentially create it as a as an over, overflow spillway, which will spill over into the space between the um, reservoir and the road. There's like a little um, holding area, if you will. There's a little spillway area right there. And then there's pipes that go under the road that carry the water over to Middle Reservoir. And then it, and then it, it continues to um, head downstream from there. 
they do have to submit plans to the town um, we have to be sure that the volume of water that they're intending to have go through those pipes is um, not going to overwhelm the pipes and therefore damage the roadway but so far we've not had any problems with that throughout this entire process the water has come out in a slow enough fashion that um, it hasn't impacted the roadway there was uh, the original there's three pipes actually under the road the oldest pipe which is also the lowest pipe the, the oldest pipe did have some erosion around the pipe that was creating some channeling um, towards the roadway we did put in some gravel to armor that um, area around the pipe and so we uh, prevented that erosion so the water has been flowing but the water has been flowing through all three pipes um, without a problem <clears throat> deep did um, cor uh, communicate to wish that they needed to um, communicate or send send notices send letters out to all of the abutting property owners um, wish did reach out to our engineering department to try and get a list of abutting property owners we help them navigate that process of how to identify who the abutting property owners are, are and, and, and their contacts. <clears throat> so we believe that those letters, if they haven't already gone out, they're in the process of getting those letters out to them. But we suspect that <clears throat> the water level that the um, that is out there now is likely going to be the remaining water level of where it will remain going forward. Um, we believe that DEEP will is the uh, if the water level is down to where it may be and is, is the road still closed or is it open now so we still have it closed until we had can verify that um, <clears throat> there that the so we did get a call today that there was concern that beavers were trying to like replug up the hole um, <clears throat> we don't want that to happen so until we know that it's stabilized yep. um, we'll we will have it closed deep is well aware that the road is closed and we don't want to keep it closed any longer than we yeah. have to and they want to expedite the reopening as well okay so we're trying to get that reopened as quickly as possible all right thank you yep um, <clears throat> any other questions on the dam okay the legislative cycle uh, session that we're in right now um, it's uh, very very active there are hundreds of bills that are going through right now <coughs> it'll make you head spin in five seconds but um, so there's a number of them that we're following but two that I wanted to highlight for you because um, one of them I gave you a copy of the testimony that um, both I and the director of uh, recreation submitted and the second one I'm at I'm getting in the process of submitting testimony both in opposition of so the first one is house bill 6574 an act concerning municipal summer camps this bill would require municipal summer camps to become licensed under the office of early childhood um, which is and that is a similar um, licensing to private daycares um, our opposition to this is that um, number one municipal um, daycare municipal summer camps we have a number of um, local oversight that already occurs to these there's a number of inspections that already occur at the local level for this um, we already background check all of our staff members they already perform um, training through CPR and all of those components um, but um, it's not done through OE, OEC, right? Um, and that would cry, would add a whole new layer of bureaucracy around that and cost. Um, it would increase cost. Um, OEC doesn't have the personnel to come out and inspect. They would have to come and inspect every location that your summer camp is going to be at. So they would have to come out and inspect Owen Bell. They would have to inspect the the individual you know we're having a, a kiss this year they would have to inspect any other sites that we would be going to um and they and they'd have to do that for every town across the state it's just unreasonable in a very short time frame um and if they don't do it then you can't hold the camp there you know so you get hamstringed for that among a laundry list of other things that they wanted to um add into add into um, the requirements so a number of municipalities um, so cost and CCM both submitted um, a testimony in opposition as well as a number of um, uh, 
municipalities have submitted opposition on that bill. The other one that I'm submitting in the process of submitting up, uh, testimony in opposition of is Senate Bill 935, and this requires is an act requiring pensions for police officers and firefighters employed by municipalities. So this um, this uh, this uh, legislation would require towns that have police officers and firefighters. For Killingly, it would just be our police officers because we don't employ firefighters <clears throat> to um, offer pensions through the state municipal employee retirement plan, which is a defined benefit plan, which is a substantially different plan than what we already offer to our, our, our employees. It is uh, substantially more expensive. It's a much, much more expensive. This um, bill was pushed by one of the union uh, groups within the state. Many uh, towns cost CCM. Many of the towns, we are all coming out in opposition to this as well. We all uh, unanimously are saying, you know, number one, this should be, if you have a union, this sh pension is collectively bargained. It should remain in a collective bargaining agreement. That is a that is decision to be made between the local between the town, the municipality, and the employees, um, that should not be um, dedicated, legislated by the state legislation. So, um, it do, so we're actively going in opposition to that. Um, ta the town of Killingly has never been a member of the Connecticut MERS uh, Municipal Employee Retirement System. We have our own defined benefit plan that we're you know more we're 100% funded on. Connecticut MERS plan is not 100% funded. Um, we don't need to be part of that plan. We manage our pension plan very well. Um, but we also sunsetted, for the most part, have sunsetted the um, availability of employees to get into the defined benefit plan. We did that many years ago because of the sustainability of it. We moved most of our employees to a defined contribution plan. So by and large, most of our employees, the only access they have is a defined contribution plan, which is uh, more predictable and uh, generally um, uh, less uh, financial, you know, more economical for the community in the long run. So, um, but still a pension. It's a it's a pension. So um, that's the other oppositional one. Um, the three items under projects with Board of Education, Kyle um, had already kind of mentioned all three of them. So we. Um, I had really approached the superintendent with regards to the HVAC systems evaluation because the Board of Education, the state approved funding last year around um, upgrades to school buildings HVAC systems, but you had to have a shovel ready project. You already had to have design, you already had to have evaluations completed, and the turnaround time on the grant submission was like 45 days. There's no way to get that done. I'm hearing that it sounds like they're going to be funding that again in the second go around. So it makes sense that perhaps the Board of Education looks at having that evaluation done. Again, uh, it's just a matter of we're more accustomed to writing these types of RFPs than, um, than their staff is. So we uh, kind of stepped in in that assistance role to assist with writing those RFPs and kind of helping them through just the procurement bid process. The rest of this is really all Board of Education. So they'll select who it is, they'll engage in and and move through that process with whatever vendor they select. But this was, we were just helping them get through the bidding process on all three of those items. Um, number seven, Owen Bell Park improvements. So um, as you, all of you may remember um, when um, Joyce Ritchie passed away. Their family members did a GoFundMe page and raised funds for, they wanted to do something in memory of her, something within the town and the family had chosen. They raised about, they raised um, $11,000. They wanted to have the installation of a new pavilion down at um, Owen Bell. And $11,000 is a lot of money. Um, and it's a, it's a great start towards that pavilion, but it doesn't fully get a pavilion. Um, uh, May Flexer had reached out to Bucky and myself and said, you know, maybe there's a way that I can get some state funding to help get uh, bridge the gap. 
and get the rest of that done. And if there's any other improvements at Owen Bell, let me see what we can do. So I drafted a lot. I, I did the letter and submitted that letter to her um, looking for funding for the, the rest of the pavilion. Um, any remaining funds that we might um, need with regards to the dredging of um, of the pond of the uh, pond at Owen Bell, uh, we will we will be putting that out to bid. So um, we'll have a more finite number on that. But um, the dredging component, and then lastly, one of the things that we've identified, and it's going to be in your capital improvement plan that's going to be presented in the budget. So I know this is a little early for submission, and it hasn't come to you guys yet, but. Um, I saw the window of opportunity and took it so um, forgive me for kind of taking that window but um, one of the things that we have seen our splash pad is as you know enormously um, popular right and it's popular not which is killingly but with the entire Northeast and it is a big draw a, a big draw and it draws people also to our stores and our shops and our restaurants right so we get a benefit from having that here but one of the things that, you know, and many times I've been to Owen Bell, one of the things that I see continuously and I hear from other families and I hear from our park staff and I hear from our recreation staff is that um, continually what we see is those really little kids, they're all around the outskirts because all of our, um, or most of them are around the outskirts, all of our features are really high up and so the water comes from higher elevations or, or, or at a higher um, pressure rate which is really geared towards older children, right? And so the little kids don't like to have that much dumped on them all at once or have that much water all at them all at once, right? And, but we have a lot of toddlers. Um, and so what's been, what we've noticed, and especially our park staff has really noticed this, our toddlers are digging holes around the splash pad and they're playing <laughs> in the puddles of mud around the splash pad, right? It, you know, kids are creative, they're great. Right, which, you know, it's their way of still enjoying, right? But so we, what I, what we wanted to look at was creating an appropriate play pad for them, geared towards toddlers, right? Near the existing splash pad, um, kind of just across that um, walk path um, and create a toddler specific one. So it'll be a lower pressure, all of the, all of the, um, um, uh, equipment will be lower to the ground, um, more t just toddler friendly, right? Um, with that, it does mean that we'll have to drill another well because the existing well does not have enough pressure to do both pa pads at the same time. Also with that ask, I've also asked for, um, I've included in that ask um, shade canopies for uh, three different shade canopies. So the trees that are right there by the parking lot are gonna have to come out. Their roots are damaged. One side is compressed by the parking lot. The other side, everybody has been putting lawn chairs in them and stomping all over them. And they're just compressed. They're starting to drop limbs and they're just, they're dying off. Um, it's time for them to go. But once we take them out, there's not really gonna be any shade. And that's gonna be a problem in July and August and you know even September when families wanna be out there for long periods of time enjoying the splash pads, but yet there's no shade, right? So we're proposing three shade structures to be put out there that would be better positioned closer to the splash pad and um, just you know easier access for families. Um, so that was the other component that we've uh, that I included in that. So I did transmit this letter to May. She has received it, um, and I will be touching base with her to see if there's anything else that she needs in that consideration process. And you know, hopefully, we'll be able to see some positive benefit come out of that. So the town is you know contributing on our side. You know, I've outlined in that in that funding request the town's contribution. The town will be doing installation for a number of these things. So, you know, our labor, our equipment um, is gonna be utilized for that. And then of course the funds that were already raised by the family and then for the dredging project, the town has already committed funds for that too. So I am showing the town's um, contributions on each of those. Um, and then lastly, um, Killingly Police, I just wanted you to be aware. Um, you know, they're just trying, um, as activity occurs or you know, maybe happening in a neighborhood. Um, 
They felt it would be good to have a form that they could give to neighbors as they're canvassing neighborhoods that, you know, here, you know, if you can remember something or if you see something, here's the information so that way somebody might be able to put it on the refrigerator or have it ready in their house. So this is, you know, it's obviously two of the forms, but um, a form that uh, an officer may hand out to a resident um, as they're canvassing a neighborhood. It, it gives them a phone number to call. If there is an active case that they're working on, it'll have a case number on it. So that way if somebody is trying to report something specific about a case, um, it's easier to, they'll know it's the case, they'll know the case number, right? And they can de directly reference that. It makes an easier connection for that. Um, and they'll also have the investigating officer's name attached to it as well. So just things, it does provide some um, tips uh, for individuals just on how to, you know, better protect their homes. Um, but just so that way you're aware of this. So if you, you know, if, if anybody, you know, brings it to your attention, you're aware that this is just a form that um, will be out in the community um, as needed. It's not, you know, going to be out all the time, but as needed, you know, we did go through a period of time that we had some um, uh, uh, home invasion activity or we had some car break-ins that were happening. Um, this can help uh, streamline that communication to the, um, to the investigating officer. And then I just listed some of the um, regular meetings and they seem to be repeat ones because they seem to be going to all the same meetings every single month like they just keep repeating any questions Mr. on the the chase reservoir yes so we, we've got this, the dep has come in and they're submitting their report yes so we've got to wait to evaluate that um, yes do you have an estimate for we're going to have to do a uh, forest management plan. Yeah, so and I think, then, yeah, okay. So for the development of a forest management plan, I think is probably going to be between the five and $10,000 mark for the development of a forest management plan. And I think that we can probably look to utilize Open Space Land Acquisition Trust for funding okay. that um, uh, development of a plan. And so, and then we would, that plan will then tell us you know, is it going to, you know, what level of investment, what level of dollars is going to be needed into um, correcting the issues that we have at that property. But this is the first of many properties that we need to do forest management plans on, right? So my goal really is to look at trying to get a forest management plan done a minimum one a year, right? Because it does cost money, right? to try and get one done a year and we're trying to go with our what I would say is our most popularly used properties so Chase Reservoir, Quandock, um, you know those um, more actively utilized properties first and then going to the properties that may just be um, blank open space because we still should have forest management plans for those that are just slated as open space um, but just to try and kind of start that process of working through what that might look like for the town. It gives, I think, the town, the Conservation Commission, Open Space Land Acquisition Committee, a better understanding of what is involved when we're inquiring or maintaining or activating a space from open, just raw open space into passive recreation or just acquiring open space. What does it mean for the town to do that? And what should we be looking at when we're looking at those? So the goal right now is for Chase because it is in such critical condition. Um, our next one, we would probably, you know, punch list and look to see about getting some input from some of the other commissions on, you know, really what's the, what's the priority list for really the next ones, but our first one is this one. Now to follow up, so we could start with the forest management plan under, or are you going to wait till next budget cycle, or would, would, could we start this? I think we can start this now. Okay. So um, our plan, my plan is hopefully, um, I'm not sure about this week because I'm inundated with budget meetings this week, but my hope is that um, between this week and next week I can meet with 
my land use staff to go over the report that we got from deep and with our town engineer to go over that report and see what we need to use out of that report in crafting that RFP. So I would like to get the RFP on the street for um, hiring a forester to develop the forest management plan. Um, so that will take us, you know, and we would hopefully be able to award that um, in, you know, April, early May. Um, we're in we're in February right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what month I'm in. So February, so yeah, by, by April, hopefully we should be able to award that, and then we would be able to have that start to develop what the forest management plan actually looks like. That does mean that it's going to be off, you know, we're not going to have a budget request in next budget cycle, this upcoming budget cycle, for implementation of a forest management plan because we're not going to have that we'll forest have management plan. plan. We're not going to have that yet. But we would be able to then strategize for the upcoming year or look at what other funding resources might be available to the town to activate a forest management plan. So there's a couple of things that we could look at. But that's where the big, the big dollar item, the forest management plan itself is not too bad. Right. But the implement, with all the dead, everything out there, it's been, I mean, I've been on, you know, Lears on the conservation since I've been on the council, and the forest management plan has been there for almost my whole time. So it's taken finally to get this step going, and um, yeah. but it's not going to be inexpensive once we get you know to make it safe and all of that. That's a but like you say, the forest management plan will take us through next year, so there's no budgeting for actually doing the work because we're not going to know the extent of it. Yeah, we're not really going to know the extent until they get through that forest management plan. And that's going to take some time for them to really assess the property and determine what really needs to get done to the property and making those short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals for the property. That's really what's in your forest management plan, the short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. So um, until we really have that, we can't really make a determination as to you know what reasonably are we looking at for money because again, each property is different. It depends on what's there. You know, there could be marketable timber in there, right? There may be other offsetting revenue that could be generated. And again, a forester would know what would potentially be revenue generation within that uh, inventory versus it's a straight out, you know, you're going to have to pay to get rid of it. Well, that's why I was looking at the forest management plan under the current budget cycle. That's why I posed that question. Yeah. So we could get started. Right. And then, because it's not that big of an amount. But right. And so you might see um, for the Open Space Land Acquisition Trust, um, that may need to have council approval for the expenditure of the funds out of um, out of the open space land acquisition trust I have to go through that step through that process so there may be a an approval level that has to occur for that um, expenditure to occur in the current fiscal year um, so you know potentially next month or the following month you might um, see an item on your agenda for that but at least we, we have monies we have something available we possibly can maybe we may did not disagree or whatever we can discuss that but there is a revenue source to do this portion right now and, we can, and then but yeah down po the road, possibly I think, I yeah think down the road we're going to be hit with a it's going to be a serious we'll expenditure and it's a start we'll um see. let's see on the um uh number one on the uh, bailey hill project so this is this is under the mud regulations they can have both you can have all three you can have industrial mm -hmm. residential and commercial use in that property so they're they're aware that yes those uses are going to be there that's a critical yeah so they that's one of the steps that they do in this evaluation is they pull all the zoning overlay what the actual uses of the property can be so they can determine at what uh what they have to what they have to look for for contamination levels so um and then they have to fill in those gaps So now uh, on the uh, school projects, on the, the HIVAC system, is uh, is there money, I guess I should have asked the question to the Board of Ed Liaison, is, is money or money in their budget to cover some of these 
engineering cost or is it something that I we're see. using in-house to get to a point or no so this is so again once they receive those uh, bids um, you know the superintendent would have to take that to the Board of Education for um, whatever funding authorization he needs from them whether they have to use non-lapsing or whether they have funds within the budget to utilize for those he he has to work through that with the Board of Education okay. uh, but that's again on, on its point uh, so what do we do we just build them for our time yes so with and with our um, with any expenditure that we've had like uh, the advertising of it any of that we just build the board we build the board of education for those costs yep we actually just charge their budget line item <clears throat> and then on the the Owen Bell the dredging project um, <coughs> is there's are you looking at any kind of a time frame or how, how is that? Look, yeah. We've got some costs. I mean, these yeah. costs are tremendous. Yeah, so the the dredging, um, the 175, uh, that was a very conservative estimate. We think that we, it might be lower than that, which is why we're getting ready to, we're going to be drafting that RFP and putting it out because um, we may actually have sufficient funds where we're at right now to get that done. If so, we'll proceed to trying moving that for beginning this July. Um, so right after the run for Ryan, which is the second Saturday in July, um, we would begin the dredging process. So we would start to do the RFP process and we were looking to start the RFP process and then we'll do the final planning process on getting the dredging done. Um, cause you want to do that one in the, really in the heat of the summer cause you want it during the driest points of the year. Are we going to curtail? So it's going to have an effect on Owen Bell. It is. It's going to really impact um, the soccer field area where the track is. That will be slated out. That'll be no longer accessible um, because the material is going to be going in that is going to be right now. That's where we have it slated to be dewatering is on the soccer field. So are, are we giving the groups that use these facilities, we're giving them... We've already notified them. And, yep. That's, a, that's shutting them down. It's, yeah. I We've already... No, that, yeah. We have to do it. We've already notified them all that right. utilize the soccer field and also cross country because it would also impact the availability of cross country for the next... Uh, for the next seasons so we've already notified them um this is a top we've been in conversations with the board of education on this and with those entities now for more than a year so this is not a surprise this project has been pretty well communicated to those organizations for a, a good amount of time now because it's a, a few comments not not too bad uh, but what are we going to do this? yeah i mean it's going to look ugly this this is critical right. path if right. we don't right and it's one of those things it's it's really ugly and it's really messy when we have to do yes. it but yes. the intent so. and that's why we're and that is also why while we're doing it we're going deeper and we're me and we're increasing the volume of it so we're not going to have to repeat this in any time anytime soon right so when was the last time it was dredged we don't know that it has been I don't think probably it never has been. It hasn't been. It was the existing yeah. pond. Then. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't yeah, been. It so again, this will go for generations to come, and we're not going to have it. But it's painful when you have to do it. It's yeah. just painful. And where does, I mean, this is under design circumstances now. We're looking, it's not just have a pond, and we, we know the flows, and there's a lot of stuff in the background. So I, I am, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a messy project. It is. But I, I think it's going to benefit Owen Bell tremendously oh, down yeah. the road. You know, so. mm -hmm. I, I, I hope I'm glad you were saying this summer because I yeah. you said following summer. Eh, no, this summer. We, that's why we want to get out to bid now. That's good. And our, our hope is that um, you know that number comes in more positively than what we've initially estimated. And the, the other item that's not on here is the the uh, health department that three dollars and seventy five oh. increase in the per capita. Um, that's a humongous. It is a significant increase. So that was um, presented at the NECOG meeting, um, this last NECOG meeting. So the NDDH has given an estimated increase for the budget. It's not a hard and firm. It's an estimated increase. So their current per capita rate is $7.50. 
They're estimating an increase of $3.75 per capita, which brings it to eleven twenty-five. dollars For Killingly, that's a $66,000 increase. It's more, it's 50%. It's a, it's a substantial increase. Um, all of the towns uh, have been um, very um, oppositional to that uh, increase. Um, I have requested um, Sue Starkey, the director for NDDH, to come to your March meeting to do a presentation on what they what that um, what that increase is for. Um, I will say at the ND, at the NECOG meeting, um, it was very abbreviated as to what the explanation was it was essentially wages and inflation and that was i think pretty much all we were told yeah. right to go into yeah there was really no details provided so um i did i have had a conversation with sue subsequently um and have reiterated to her the need for um, more details especially around payroll um, one thing I had asked at the NECOG meeting was if the payroll included an expansion of service. She did finally indicate that it appears that they were going to be hiring one additional position, but we I don't know to what extent that increase in salary, what that costs them, or what that impact is to the per capita. Um, <clears throat> the She indicated me by, to me by phone that she, working with her board of fi her finance group, that they were, she anticipated that they were down to at least a two and a half, a two dollar and fifty cent increase, and potentially lower than that. And they're working on trying to further reduce that. Again, I'm I'm not sure at what extent that is. Um, I was, I will be communicating with our. I have not yet. I will be communicating with our directors, our board members. So we have three. We have two board members and the borough has a board member. I will be communicating with the with the members, with our board members, and I will be meeting with the with the borough um, next week um, to um, kind of discuss what their viewpoints are on this. I'm looking to have the NDDH, our NDDH board members come to your um, March special meeting so that way you can have a meeting with just your board members as opposed to also having the executive director for Sue, have Sue here as well but you can have a meeting with just your representatives to give them guidance um, the number from NDDH does not get um, finalized until the their board of directors uh, approves their budget in April as far as what the town has for alternatives um, we, in order for us to go to a different health district, so Eastern Highlands is another health, health district, Ledge Light is another health district. Um, in order for us to go to either one of those health districts, we, the legislative body would have had to have taken action before January 1st, which we have not. So we are in it for next fiscal year. Uh, that's by state statute. Um, our board members, the board, by joining NDDH, by their bylaws and becoming a member of NDDH, we agreed that our board member acts as the fiscal person, if you will, for our representation on NDDH. And whatever NDDH board sets for their budget means the town will fund. So I think it's imperative that our board members understand the town's position, um, your position on where you see that funding, because they will be taking that and setting that action. And once they set that budget in April, that will be the town's responsibility for funding NDDH in next fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> that being said, we can look at alternatives for the following fiscal year. Um, and there's a number of different all options that we could look at after that. Um, and, you know, we can um, have that as a discussion item on a future agenda to, you know, for you guys to give me direction on what you want me to consider and look at and bring back to you. So at some point after April, when we see what's going on, then yep. we could determine if we want to 
leave them. We can yes. vote on that as long as before. As long as you January vote on it before January 1st of next year. And how many municipalities on the, are in the Northeast District? Um, it's all of them that are in NECOG. It's, there's quite... 13, I oh, I think it's more than that. 13 or 19? There's more than that. There's more than... 17. It's 13 or 19. So I've been looking at all increase. the districts around the state. What's a number? And putting numbers together. Yeah. And that ask is pretty high. Yeah, so um, Eastern Highlands, uh, their increase, their um, rate, per capita rate, um, including their increase for next year, brings their per capita rate to 550 for next year. Um, Eastern Highlands, la uh, including their increase to come into next year, brings their per capita rate to right around, I think it's like in um, the mid-720s. So um, it's a substantial increase, um, and so um, that's what I have, I have uh, Sue, and she has already responded saying that she will be here on March 14th mm -hmm. for our presentation. Um, and um, I will be, again, reaching out to the our, our board representatives on NDDH to see. I have spoken to Dave Griffiths. He said that he would be willing to come at your special meeting in March. I'll reconfirm that with him. I just have to reach out to your other new member, um, Sean. See, because through the grapevine, they haven't been doing the restaurant inspections in a timely manner, but no one wants to complain because of reprisals from them. From them. Right. The septic guys, you know, kind of not quite as bad, but they're saying, you know, there's some issues. They're not showing up on time, whatever. But they will support everybody from out of town that goes to the Brooklyn Fair. Those permits are issued. The, all these others, they're the out of town people are taken care of. And we, we are, they'll sort of, but. Nobody wants to admit to that. It's yeah. you can't say my name. You can't. Yep. And I'm getting it from a number of individuals. So it's I, that's why I bring this up forward tonight. That there's some, you know. Yeah. It's right on there. Not to interrupt it. It's right on their website about not increasing the fees for the the Brooklyn and Woodstock Fair for those. They they want to keep those costs down. So instead of increasing a revenue stream, they'd rather put it on us. Oh, that's see that. Okay, I've not got that. I'm, okay, I've been well, doing a lot of this. research. Yes, no, this is good. That's well, you were at the at the uh, uh, yeah, NECOG meeting, so yeah, I've been typing. This is yeah. So we need I've been to on get the phone. <laughs> this is get this information out there. And yeah, we have to. Now I do have one question. Um, when we have our board members, the NDDH board members here for the special meeting, can we discuss things with them under executive session? Is that an option? Um, I can check with our um, attorney, but I don't know that it would meet the executive session requirements. So I think yeah. that you would be an open session. Okay. Just to comment on that, I think it would be better for the public to hear why we have a concern. Oh, because, I, I, you know, I they get so part. much I praise. Think. And I think it's important that people understand, like, what they actually do compared to what they're supposed to do yeah. and what this increase could impact all of our constituents <clears throat> like the town and it's not just us it's all of these municipalities yeah. so i think it should be public yeah. and i completely understand that i also look at it from the aspect of sometimes that you'll get more information out of someone if they're if it's in executive session and it's not televised um, but i mean it as mary said it's probably not going to be something that would be eligible for it. yeah it wouldn't be eligible for executive there. session okay and I will say that I have had a number of towns uh, reach out to me um, just, you know, feeling out what it, you know, what do you think Killingly is going to be looking to do? And I've reached out to a number of communities just to, you know, gauge what their responses were. And I can say that a number of them are looking for alternatives. Real quick on the police uh, communications. Has that been put on, like, uh, the Facebook page or anything so that whether people aren't going... Is this a fake thing that I've been yeah. getting? Yeah, no, I haven't put it out yet. I wanted to okay. first put it out here um, and let you all be aware of it, and then we'll be putting it out on a social media press. Very good. There, I, I, uh, that's all I could think about is, uh, you know, I come home and I'm like, is this real? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, we will put it out as a social media press. Okay. 
and uh, I guess following up on the uh, health department, the water issues up at the high school, it's, that's under the NDDH. And uh, are they responding, if there's issues up there, are they responding, I should ask, yeah, it actually ends up because it's considered a public drinking water. Uh, it's considered a public drinking treatment facility. So it actually falls under the state public drinking um, authority. It doesn't fall under NDDH. Okay, all right. It's not like a private uh, no, system it's well. Right. It's considered because of the because of the number of people that it services. It's considered a, pu a public drinking system. So it's not like your typical uh, home well or anything like no, that. It's, it's so it doesn't right. fall under NDDH. It falls under the State Drinking Water Authority, State okay. Drinking Water. I was wondering, I'm thinking about that. Are they responding? In, with the issues we've had up there, yeah. that's critical. No, it's the responding. state that responds to okay. that. All right. And, that's yes, the state does respond. Okay, good. No, I, I can tell you that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, two, two quick things. Um, Back to um, Parks and Rec and their summer camp, um, having been involved with them and helping secure their training, um, I can honestly tell you I think we are the only municipal summer program that makes it mandatory that their, their, all of their staff, not just the counselors, all of their staff receive first aid and CPR recertification every single year. Um, so. Um, I think some I think in that case and I think we're probably better qualified than some private daycares are um, as to the health department having sat on the board um, I'm not overly surprised um, Sue was always Jones in trying to get a larger increase to do and with I know I, I had a, had a very hard time trying to keep her at bay so I don't know if the board has relinquished some of the, the reins they had on her proposals. Um, I'm hoping that the board will pull her back um, because I think it would be devastating, particularly if several of the towns decide to leave NDDH, that would cripple them. Or they'd be taken over by another district, right? No. They wouldn't? How would that work? No, everybody, uh, in all the towns would choose what their options would be. So whether uh, towns would choose to go to another district or whether towns would choose to form uh, their own internal health department. Yep. Um, but they don't get taken over by another district. So just yeah, you, you, can, you can put on your own health person right. to, to, right. to oh, make sure you meet your 10 essential health services. Yep. I'm just going to add real quick the Frontier Project. Um, I'm glad this is going through. I, I know it's going to be a huge uh, benefit for the community. Um, and I, having conversations with Frontier over the project, they have been extremely responsive. Uh, questions I had due to where the equipment was going to be located. I was one of the people that got notified um, because of where my property is. And they got back to me almost instantly. Um, correspondence every time I emailed them they came back um, so I was definitely impressed with their level of customer service but are they going to cover the whole town because we've had issues with COVID that everybody we have to put um, well, I don't know what it was to get internet everywhere yeah. so their their rollout will cover all of the town where they're, um, how their their implementation is going. So you're not necessarily going to see them on every single street, but their, um, their it will still cover the entire entirety of the town. Any other questions, comments? All right, we will move on in the agenda. Next item up is 14A unfinished business for town council action. Consideration and action on a resolution authorizing the issuance of a letter supporting KB Ambulance's application for non-emergency transportation licensing. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this resolution? I'd like to make a motion to take it off the floor, the if table. that's possible, off the table. Uh, my understanding is if this isn't picked up and discussed at this meeting, this is the last meeting, it's on the agenda and it falls off. 
the agenda. It wouldn't be on the, any subsequent meetings. So we have a motion to take it off the floor. I'll second it. Discussion. Just for clarification, this means that the item would not be on any subsequent meetings unless it was added no. to an agenda as. No, so what they're there. So I want to make sure oh. we understand that we clarify. So when you're taking something, when you're when you're making a motion to take something off the table, that means that you are motioning to begin discussion of the item. So you want to discuss the item. Yes. That's what you're doing tonight is you, when you take it off the table, you're discussing the, you're opening the item for discussion and possible motion. Okay. Is that, that's. I believe I wanted discussion, yeah. Okay. So we got a motion and a second. All those in favor of taking it off the table, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. All right, so we are open for discussion over the letter of endorsement for KB Ambulance for the licensing. So what do we have for comments? Uh, my my comment is that it, we had um, several di well a couple of different answers to that. Um, so Day Kimball Hospital said that they didn't need a letter. So why are they coming to us if they don't need a letter? Um, I will respond to that one um, because I had lengthy discussion with KB Ambulance over that. I have actually seen the. Um, documents that are required for submission for the application and the letter is not necessary from Killingly it would only be necessary from Putnam um, what I was told by KB ambulance the reason why they came to Killingly for a letter as well was out of respect for the fact that they are here in Killingly and they service Killingly is why they came to us they knew they didn't need the letter um, they came to us as they said out of respect for us well, out of respect for us, what about their other municipalities? I do not know if they had reached out to them after. Um, I did have a discussion. When I had my discussion with them, I did ask them um, if, they had, if they were planning on reaching out to them, and they said they were discussing it. So I don't know if they have or not. It seems like they put a lot of effort into not needing us. I'll leave that open. Um, I did have a discussion with someone at OEMS um, asking what the ramifications would be if they didn't receive a letter from us, um, a letter of support from the Killingly Town Council. And what I was told was it wouldn't necessarily stop them from getting the license, but they may have to answer questions. And now if the Killingly Town Council came out with a letter in opposition of them, then it may uh, make it more difficult for them to get their license. Mr. Wood. So the one thing I'll say about all of this is that we gave them homework, and I think we even gave Dave Kimball homework. And when we asked them questions for follow-up, they didn't give us answers. And that's, that's one thing uh, I'm not really thrilled about, the fact that uh, the chairman of their, their board reached out to me a few weeks ago but via text message, and I responded in kind through email, and I have the email with me with multiple questions, and I cc'd our chairman in that email as well. Um, and I still don't have answers to questions that concerns me you know we're asking some of it simple questions some of it all of our questions are legitimate we're trying to understand and the fact that they don't want to give answers um, to the, the town's people it's not just us we represent the entire town um, and on top of that we also help part fun, partially fund them as well uh, I think that they should have been answering us right straight along and that's to me um, 
if he will, I, I feel like we've been disrespected on that end. Well, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, a couple weeks ago, Tammy had contacted me and asked um, if I would like to go meet with the director, same person, and he canceled on us 15 minutes prior to when we were supposed to meet with him with no follow-up since, right? Um, I Or did you get I, I did actually meet with their board chair. Um, it's kind of the same line. They, you know, it's all, it's all private. And, yeah, they are a private entity. I understand that. Um, my concern is the integrity of the 911 system because they're being – in order to institute this, you need two ambulances and 12 to 13 people. And if you're already running short on individuals – and I was at REC last night at the REC Commission meeting, and one of the members mentioned the fact that one of the KB ambulances was actually in a traffic accident the day before. Um, so if you got two spares and one's in an accident, now who, how are you transporting for Killingly and this transport service? If you, I mean, you can't just go to the local car dealership and get a, an ambulance. Um, I, I'm very, very concerned. I mean, we, Day Kimball gave us nothing but flower, flowers, really. I mean, we're, we're behind, we're, we're here to support them. Well, how are you going to support them? This is a, a significant amount of money to get this off the ground. And I totally in, in hope that they do get this off the ground, but the way they're going about it is not financially, fiscally responsible. And um, I, I've been catching a lot of flack from people, you know, oh, you know, you, you know this is about this, that, and everything. I think it needs to be put out there. It's, even if we don't give them the letter of, and one of the things that when I met with their board chair, well, this isn't gonna look good on you guys. <laughs> I, I wanted to I wanted to make sure people understand we're we're looking out for the entire town. I mean, I hope that KB can get it off the off the ground because that's a way to expand their business. And you, and you and business in order to survive has to expand. But this is not a good way of going about it. It's it's off a wing and a prayer and you know, there's not a whole lot of resources. If Day Kimball didn't have the money to be able to, to pay to help them get this off the ground, then I know, I mean, they're supposed to be a nonprofit. How, how are they going to come up with the money? If Day Kimball couldn't come up with it, how is KB going to get it? So I just, and I, I have, I mean, I, I look, totally support all those EMTs and medics. I mean, my job would be impossible to do if, if I didn't have them. But I want to make sure that KB Ambulance is around for another 70 plus years. Um, and I, I'm very concerned that this could very well be a, be a bad thing. And I want to make sure that people understand. I want it publicly out there that I want them to, to ex I would love to see them expand, but not this way. This is, this is too off rushed and off the cuff, and it's not my responsibility to, over, to take care because other people didn't do their jobs right. Thank you. I, I just want to throw out there that it, it isn't on KB Ambulance that this was rushed. This, no. was, oh. this was brought not to the Oh, no, absolutely not. not. In, in not December, and it was less than 30 days from when Day Kimball wasn't going to have a transport service. Um, and... The way I looked at it is KB was just trying to step up and fill a hole. Now, um, whether that's the best thing for the community or not, it's a matter of opinion. And, and it's, it could go one of three ways. I mean, it, it, this could go great where everything works out great and it's great for Day Kimball, it's great for KB Ambulance, and it's great for the community because now they've got more staffing and more vehicles. Um, and if there is a catastrophe, we have a huge accident, um, a, a multi-car accident on a highway, and, and you need multiple ambulances out there, and we have the additional equipment and staff for it, that would be great um, if that's the way it works out. Um, if it doesn't, 
it could really tax the 911 system. And that's one thing I would absolutely hate to see. There's way too many ifs in what you just said. I know. Way too many ifs. The, the problem with the ifs is they have no backup. They have no backup plan. They need to have a plan. There's no, these, they sat here and gave us word sandwiches all night long with no backup plan. Okay, we're going to do this, but if this fails, we're going to be able to do this. If this fails, we're going to be able to do this. What if we can't do this? You know, you, you have to have a plan. It's okay to have the what ifs, but if you have a backup plan to, to take care of your issues, then it's going to be, you know, then it's going to be substantial. You know what I mean? Maybe that's not the correct terminology, but you need a plan. They have no plan. Well said. Absolutely. And, and I will be completely honest. The one thing that I had been contemplating, because the wording of the required documents, even though it wasn't required from Killingly, um, was the letter of support would have to come from the chief elected official. Um, in Putnam, that would have been the mayor. In Killingly, the chief elected official actually is the chairman of the town council. Um, I had contemplated writing a letter myself. Um, I was on the fence back and forth. I, I really was on this one. And it was a lot of the information that I got from a lot of people um, who are very knowledgeable um, with everything that's going on that swayed me away from uh, sending a letter out just as the chairman without the support of the council. And had I drafted a letter like that, there would have not been no we, it would have been I. Um, there, it would have been just for me as the chairman. Um, I just want to be completely transparent with everybody that that is something, and I, I know I've discussed it with a lot of you, that that was something I had been contemplating. So I think for me, the lack of transparency from Dave Kimball, these are the reasons I'm not in support. Um, if KB already had the staffing, I would probably be on board because it absolutely could benefit them. The other thing is they are a nonprofit. This is a revenue stream and they're not showing us where the startup funding for that is coming from. And they're not being transparent when we asked how much overtime over the past year and they refused to answer that. They're a nonprofit and we give them funding and so do their other municipalities in the budget every year. I think we have a right to know how much overtime they're paying when they sat right there and stated that this transfer for Day Kimball right now is strictly overtime. So, I mean, what is this costing KB to do of uh, Day Kimball right now? They were already in financial dire straits. Um, how, who's paying for the startup? And they don't have enough people. And we know there's a national shortage on personnel for emergency services. So when they say they need 12 to 13 people to run this thing, where are they getting them? The, without the certificate, Dave Kimball has to, is picking up the cost of the whole transfer. Yeah, yeah they are at, at overtime rates. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, yeah, so it it just it doesn't it seems like Dave Kimball got themselves in a crunch. Um, we found out through AMR there was information you know, not shared with us, shared, you know, misinformation, I'll call it. Um, and then we get the whole picture, and they actually had longer. They could have gone to KB sooner than they did. And it seems like they waited, and this is just my opinion, and I don't care, I'll be the bad guy. They waited until crunch time to force us into a decision, and I don't. that's not good for anybody. I feel like uh, I'm not that comfortable going against the fire department and the fire chiefs, um, but I feel like if the letter said, good job, you know, you're, you're a great ambulance company, we like you, good luck, but if it's going to talk about financial feasibility, we just don't have the, I'm not hearing good things. So that's a, that's a different letter than just saying, we like you, good luck, <laughs> and that doesn't sound like what they're asking for. Oh, KB Ambulance does a fantastic job. I'm not knocking KB at all. This plan of theirs with Day Kimball has too many questions, and they do not have the personnel to kick this off. And where's the money coming from? That's what I was saying. Yeah. 
in a different way. Yeah, they're, they're great at what they do. And I know, and I think it was our last meeting, you did have a copy of the letter in the agenda. Yes, I do have that a, a letter with me. Um, so the letter that was drafted, I can just read it quickly. It's a very short letter. It says, KB Ambulance Corp. Inc. has submitted an application seeking licensure to expand services to provide non-emergency transport for Day Kimball Hospital, including adding two additional ambulances and one paramedic non-transport unit. The Killingly, Town Council, the Killingly Town Council writes this letter in support of KB Ambulance Corp's application. Please do not hesitate to contact me should you have any questions. So it's a very short. Um, it doesn't go into financial feasibility or anything like that. It just simply says that we support KB. That's it. Yeah, but it does talk about yes. financial. It says two ambulances and if that because not, that's what their application yeah. says. Their application yeah. has to state because yeah. they don't that it, that it expands yeah. their fleet. Yep. They that have to the, they have to request authorization to add additional ambulances in order to have another ambulance on the road. They can't just buy an ambulance yeah. and put an ambulance oh. on the road. No, right. They yeah. have to get authorization through OEMS for that and so that's what that application does it, it gives them authorization to have those addition a, additional ambulances on the road and so that's why that's specifically written in there like that is because that's what the app part of the, that's what that application is for yeah but how can we be held hostage verbiage on a letter that we are submitting we're just saying you're doing a good job we recommend this all of a sudden if there's language in there there's some financial liability this this more like I don't like that I, I couldn't I don't there is no liability to yeah. the town yeah and, and that's a discussion that we had had with the town attorney as well that there is no liability on the town for the town supporting this letter because right, that was one question I had right from the beginning um, the See, I, I, and I missed the I missed the, the fire chiefs and all that so it's yeah. I, I, it's I'm at a, a disadvantage so um, the, there's no financial you know, obligation from the town in regards to this because we're not purchasing their ambulances or things like that. However, should yeah, they not get they their transfer license, should, should the state deny them because that process in and of itself is not an easy process. I, I Nobody can really think of the last time anybody got a transfer license um, and companies have tried. Um, so KB Ambulance now secures all this additional personnel where is their funding coming from? Exactly. And so now it's going to be the burden of Killingly, Pomfret, Eastford, and Hampton to supplement that? I mean, that's that to me is not. My understanding is. Again, it's another what if, but. My understanding is they can't even purchase the ambulances or the, the fly car or right. um, uh, paramedic transport without getting the license. So they wouldn't be buying them prior to getting the license because yeah. they wouldn't be, there's, they have, don't have the authority to. That's my understanding with this whole process is it isn't like they're going to buy the ambulances and not get the license and then it fall back on the towns that support them. Um, they just wouldn't be able to buy them, period, until they get the license. And then at that point, then it would fall under the contract that they have with Day Kimball to cover the cost of it. And again, that was a question I had for uh, KB that I emailed asking. Uh, has Day Kimball paid? I didn't ask for financial like amounts, yeah. things like that. That was not my business to know. Yeah. I don't feel like that's our business to know. But I, I asked if they've actually even paid anything. And again, I've not received a single answer. Again, I, I think our, our our the residents in this town deserve answers for these kind of things. And uh, you know, I am kind of knocking them a little bit because of a lack of transparency. You know, th that's where my bigger issue comes in. Yeah. So if there wasn't a vote in favor of sending that letter that you just read, there would be no letter sent at all. We wouldn't send one opposing it. Correct. There's no motion on the table to draft one opposing it. You have no motion on the table to send a letter, period. Exactly. We, we took you're it just off the table discussion. for discussion. You're just discussing. So you would be looking, you still would call a motion yep. on the item. Is there any further discussion?
So at this point, we'll move back to, I will entertain a motion to adopt the resolution um, authorizing issuance. There was a motion and a second to take it off the table for discussion. Okay. Um, so doesn't it just die if we don't? If nobody makes a motion at this point, and right? Second. If you call for the motion oh, okay. and All nobody right. makes a motion at this point, okay. then it dies. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't come back on your next agenda. Correct. So does anyone want to make a motion to uh, adopt this resolution? Seeing none, we'll move on on the agenda. Next item on the agenda is 15A, new business consideration and action on a resolution setting the dates, times, and places of the public hearing, the annual town meeting, and the adjourned annual town meeting machine vote on a 2023 to 2024 budget ordinance. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Wood. Ms. Cloria, if you could go over this, please. Yes, so this is the annual um, resolution that you do setting the dates for the public hearing. <clears throat> and really it's the setting the public hearing and the machine vote. We incorporate the annual town meeting as part of that, um, just so that way we have the full dates put out. But um, the public hearing by charter is required to be held no later than the 15th of April. Typically that town public hearing for the budget is held on the 2nd Thursday in April that's historically when we have held it so this follows that same historic historical pattern of Thursday April 13th 7 p.m. at the high school the annual town meeting by charter is the first Monday in May so that'll be May 1st again at the at the high school in the auditorium the adjourned uh, town meeting uh, all-day machine vote is followed the subsequent Tuesday uh, the week after the week after the <clears throat> annual town meeting so that'll be Tuesday May 9th and that's at both polling locations for the full duration of polling times from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both the central office and at the high school um, <clears throat> so this is following um, the same format of all of our historical time frames for budgetary uh, votes <clears throat> and we have gotten approvals for um, all, all three dates for all of the facilities. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on on the agenda. Next item up is 15B. Consideration and action on the resolution to authorize the execution of an operating agreement regarding operating costs of the Kilnally Sewerage Treatment Plant and other joint services between the Town of Brooklyn and the Town of Kilnally. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make the motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Petula. Do I have a second? <coughs> I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Wood. Uh, Ms. Clory, can you go over this, please? Sure. So the Town of Killingly, um, we ex uh, our wastewater treatment plant accepts the Brooklyn wastewater discharge. We've had a long-standing contract with uh, Brooklyn, um, and it outlines the billing processes and reporting processes under that operating agreement. That operating agreement expired in December. The parties have been in negotiation on that. Um, <clears throat> they, um, the final contract was presented to the Killingly WPCA at their January 18th meeting, and they have recommended this um, agreement to you for approval. Essentially, the, really the primary changes within the agreement is um, there's a slight increase in um, average daily flow capacity that um, we have um, kind of increased that top number from 0 0.30 to 0 0.36 um, MGD um, for there. That's just um, recognizing analytically kind of where they where they're at with a little bit of buffer room for any potential um, 
uh, increase. The other more uh, significant increase that we may or change that we have done to the agreement is um, prior they had to notify us for any new commercial or industrial wastewater discharge sources um, under this agreement they'll have to notify us for any new um, discharge uh, uh, wastewater discharge um, and that'll give us a better handle on you know any new ads to the system and um, <clears throat> you know any additional development that may um, come through so those are really the two um, main differences again they pay based off of their flows that come to our plant so it's all based on their actual flows um, we have that metered and um, that has um, overall gone very well they participate in all of the expenses um, within our budget so they pay their share in accordance with the flow compared to the overall plant it has been this contract has been reviewed by legal and um, has approved it as well thank you any questions or comments and I did forget to mention it is a five-year agreement thank you now if if we're looking at doing the upgrade for capacity at the sewer plant does that show up if we're spending money to upgrade the capacity yep. so they participate in the capital investments okay they do they also participate in any debt service that we issue so those all uh, get factored within their contract um, and as you well as you're aware typically um, a wastewater facility upgrade is likely longer than a five-year time span to get that kicked off so this would go back through negotiation again before we even get close to that time frame so um, I think that we have more than substantial time for that conversation if there need to be an additional revision to this but I will say they participated already within our current facility upgrade based on the current language um, so it would f it would follow the same uh, process for any additional upgrade they're participating in the costs of the existing facility upgrade that we just went through and how is the um, are the payments on a regular basis there were times when things were not quite yeah no we've actually had a pr we've had a pretty good um, uh, consistency with Brooklyn um, so we send out an estimate we send out the estimated billing um, <clears throat> about the beginning about the beginning of the year middle of the year we do a true up on that this uh, agreement outlines the timeline for that billing so we have specific timeline parameters within that billing and we've been both sides been very adherent to that and we have a true up after the audit is completed that we do with them any further questions seeing none all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. aye. opposed abstentions motion carries unanimously we'll now move on in the agenda next item up is item 15c consideration and action on a resolution of authorizing the town manager to execute and implement an affirmative action policy statement uh, can I get a motion to adopt this can Mr. I make Chair, a I would like to make a motion to include 15 C D E F G H and I as one you beat me to it <laughs> second that motion <laughs> so we have a motion to adopt items 15 C D E F G H and I and was there a second on that oh, uh, yeah okay Kevin all right Kevin? So motion was made by Mr. <laughs> I don't Kevin. know there's like a lot of seconds <laughs> that just went <laughs> seconded by Mr. Cartula 
uh, discussion, Ms. Clory, if you could go over these. Um, so this is annually come before the town council. These are all re uh, um, these are re affirmations of existing policies that the town has. Um, the reason they come before you annually is it's part of a grant process that we have to have the council re um, certify, reaffirm um, all of these policies. But they've been longstanding policies, most of them. Even if you didn't reaffirm them, we would still have to abide by them anyway because. They are required by federal or state law um, regardless, but um, either way, um, uh, we largely, uh, this, pro this process right here is largely uh, related to our small cities grant program, which does a lot of housing rehabilitation programs as well as um, we're um, recipient of funding a, a little over $800,000 right now for the um, renovations to the domestic violence shelter um, locally. And um, that program, the Small Cities Grant Program and Housing Program has brought in a substantial amount of um, grant funding to uh, low-income individuals to do substantial um, improvements to their properties. So um, that's why it's before you, all of them. Thank you. Discussions? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 16 council member reports and comments. Mr. Grandowski, would you like to start? Um, Don Bramwell presented everything that I was going to say tonight, so <laughs> early on. So we, we got that over in the beginning of the meeting. And the sewer authority, Michelle, will handle that. Well, the beginning of the meeting was a long time ago. You want to just give us a refresher? <laughs> 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 Mr. Whitehead. Uh, so the Solid Waste Committee met, and Dave had notified us, and that we, we knew anyway that the solid sales contract is up for renewal um, and he's what he's in negotiations still hopefully negotiations yeah, so he sent he has sent a request to Casella for um, getting to the negotiating table to look at what a renewal of that contract would look look like. We haven't received a response yet from Casella, so he is still pursuing them on getting what a renewal might look like for that to bring back to the Solid Waste Subcommittee for consideration. And we discussed as as every meeting that you know it's just it's getting harder and harder to, to get rid of the waste and uh, it's, it's an issue it's going to be a costly issue coming up and uh, we're not sure how, how that's all going to uh, pan out. Just got one question. I know there, there had been discussion previously um, in regards to a facility to bring food waste to. Um, has there been any further discussion he, on David, that? David mentioned that and he is looking into that. So you can update me. But Thank then you. the permitting process is, that's yeah. big. Where do you put it? I mean, I think we'd get, where, where would we Where would we do it? There'd be an uproar about. Uh, so like a gigantic in, 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 compost? You know, it'd yes. be nice to have, oh. but. A r anaerobic digester, so it's not compost. Yeah. It's not I'm, a compost like, pile. It's an anaerobic digesting <laughs> facility. But again, it's still something that you have to. Not only do you have to have the facility, but you also have to have enough food waste to feed it, and you have to be able to get that food waste transported in enough timely manner, depending on what you're utilizing that anaerobic digester for. So it can be used to create power. It can also be used to create. Um, uh, other products um, th that the food th that that food can be processed into other products right but th that would depend on what transportation system is available in the area to transport that food waste so um, there's a lot of focus on trying to hit high food production waste areas um, to be able to feed anaerobic digestion in the and the location would have to be on a municipal sewer line. Yeah, when does the public safety 
We don't have a public safety meeting at this point in time because we only have one member. Um, everyone else had resigned, resigned off of the Public Safety Commission. So we don't have, we've been advertising for that committee now for quite some time and um, we haven't had any interest at this point um, in new members. I haven't actually touched base with the one member that we still have on there to make sure that um, he's still knows he's a member. You would think, but I, so um, I think what it, largely what that is is though that is an advisory committee. And so um, by the ordinance in which it's created, it is an advisory committee and it's a project-based committee. So that is not one that necessarily oversees like the law, like our police department or our fire departments or um, our ambulance company. It doesn't oversee any of those. Um, or our, our fire or our building departments, it doesn't oversee any of those. All it, it, it's a it's a project base. So it's if the the town council has a project, and I can see where when we get to the place where we want to evaluate the next steps for the constabulary, potentially that's the committee that starts that process of evaluating because that's the committee that evaluated it or started the evaluation of that years back, right? So that might be the committee that the town council says we need to re-engage the public safety committee to evaluate what is really the next steps for our constabulary moving forward, right? Um, the last few years, because there really hasn't been significant public safety projects, I think it's just kind of lost interest, right? Um, because there really hasn't been a lot of real, um, you know, driving projects um, on, on that front. So it's really, project-based I think there's some initially when people think public safety committee they think oh well we're gonna oversee the police department like a like a police commission or we're gonna oversee and there was some of that when we first when I first got back here um, some of the public safety commission members really felt that the fire departments and the police reported to them oh, okay. they, did. they did they thought the police and the fire and the fire marshal reported to them and they were really upset that those entities were not showing up at those meetings and so i had to come back with them and go over what their charge ordinance was and have them really kind of walk through what this really what what were they really charged with and and a lot of that i think really dealt with the project around the law enforcement component and and how in depth that was um and the length of time that took um when people sit on a committee for a long period of time um, and they the the perception of what their tasks are can sometimes get distorted over time right and so they really felt that those entities reported to them um, and that that was a little challenging for for that group so um, trying to make sure that we you know collectively understood what that was um, but again, we just didn't really, we, the public safety committee, we just really haven't had a lot of um, real projects to give to them from a public safety standpoint. Um, and I, again, I see as we come down the pike, as we're starting to come into hiring, getting to that threshold of 10 officers, which was what the original benchmark was, as we get to that um, original benchmark, then it's going to be what's the next steps where do we go i think that's a that's clearly a public safety committee project that the town council may assign to them and that's where i think we might be able to get re-engagement with that group one of the projects that um, when i was on public safety uh, before i uh, ran for council was a child sea safety clinic which was something i really wanted to see go forward um, it was something they had started continuing with after um, I stepped down from public safety when I got elected to the council, and unfortunately, it was just something that was around a time frame when everybody started um, resigning. It wasn't much longer after that. Yeah. Um, and and I, I will admit, I mean, a lot of uh, when I was on a public safety committee, um, a lot of our direction came from our previous town manager, and then um, when Ms. Corio came on board and, and addressed the fact that this is what the ordinance authorizes them to do, um, I realized that half of the stuff we were told we were doing isn't in the ordinance. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, and then with regards to the child safety, see, I have brought that up to our law enforcement. So that is a program that they are looking into to see if that's something that they can reestablish. And that 
would make sense for them to establish something along those lines. So our law enforcement is looking at that to see if they can re-engage in some community outreach program around child safety seats. Um, uh, not necessarily, you know, a lot of them have gone away from physically showing parents how to install safety seats because there's so many different types of safety seats and they all have different instructions and parents pop them out all the time and you know just because a lawn an officer installed it doesn't mean that the parent didn't pop it out and not reinstall it properly right and so the state PD got away from doing it because of that risk exposure but um, so we I did talk to my law enforcement um, office with regards to that they do want to see if they can develop a program around that that provides some educational opportunities around um, child seat safety in proper installation but also in properly putting your child in the safety seat properly clipping your child actually into the safety seat as well because they find that there's a lot of kids that are in safety seats but they're not properly they're not properly clipped into the safety seat and that causes serious injury as well so um they kind of want to look at trying to do a twofold educational experience on that and the other piece too would be making sure you're using the right type of seats correct for the right age and the right size right, weight right, yeah. right all of that so yes um but i have brought that to their attention I know we got sidetracked, but we'll move back on to Ms. Murphy. Um, I met with Agricultural Commission. They're doing a lot of classes this year, bee class, mushroom class. Um, early April is when uh, the next green newsletter is coming out. Um, they accepted a resolution to become a pollinator-friendly community, and that was something that Jill wanted. And Dana Hopkins is going to do another haunted trail on uh, Hidden Hollow Farms this year. If people, he's looking for volunteers, if anybody knows anything about that. Um, let's see what else. I met with the WPCA and uh, let's see, HVAC project uh, is open for bid. They're trying to get new uh, system on the roof. Park pump station, they're still waiting on the pumps. Those two pumps need to be replaced. Um, the collection system. North River Lane they, uh, to Maple Street sewer line, they get all the trees cut down for that. Reynolds Street project, they're still uh, working on that. Brooklyn agreement, she spoke about. Uh, there was one accidental exceedance mixing up the samples. And um, they're still having trouble getting their grade four plant superintendent and so they're looking at maybe um, either Joe continuing to take the test or trying to get a waiver uh, from the state so thank you thank you mr. wood uh, so I did attend the NECOG meeting as well obviously we heard a lot about the NDDH I will say that I did have reached out to representative Dolphinase uh, and her and Senator Summers are really on this as well to ch hopefully change some of the legislation so that way their towns aren't, um, if you will, surprised by the fact that we actually have to opt out by January 1st. Uh, it'll give us hopefully a, a better option, but of course that goes through the legislature. Um, and just uh, as an aside for everybody as, as well, uh, we didn't find out about any of this rate increase until last month, la this, this month, last month meeting. So it's not like we had a ch choice of or a chance to even discuss this prior to now so just to add a little bit more to that um, and also on the public safety end, I know I, I, I think I brought it up now twice in our goal setting session I'd really want to see that whole uh, committee re revisioned and um, possible charter change on how we do it but that that's the so other it's road. now an ordinance oh, so I'm that sorry, would be ordinance, ordinance yeah. of committee yes ordinance I attended solid waste as Mr. Whitehead had gone over what we had discussed there and uh, permanent building committee they went over the bids that were opened on the specific uh, things that they do uh, for the construction thing this, this is all separated out with sheetrock electric glass and plumbing um, 
they went over the bids that were open. Some of them, they'd only received one bid. I think they were sending them back out for another bid and trying to break them up into a, uh, more smaller items so they'd get more interest in bids. And uh, an overview of the budget where they're still projecting it to be under budget. That's really good to hear. Um, I attended the Housing Authority meeting. Um, they elected their officers. They approved their audit and they submitted an application for critical needs funding for CO2 and smoke detectors at Maple Courts 2 for 43 different units. Um, the units were put in in 2016 and they had a seven year shelf life. Um, so <laughs> they're realizing they have to replace them now. Um, and a total cost on that would have been 14,000 uh, to replace that. And they set their meeting dates and their holiday schedule. And that's all I have. Um, I went to Board of Ed last week, but Kyle reported for me, so thank you. Ms. Wakefield. Um, so the Rec Commission meeting was supposed to be the end of uh, January. However, we had a little ice winter thing that got it canceled. So they actually met last night. Um, a lot of um, good things were happening. Um, the, they actually have drafted a refund policy that actually came out of a um, situation with the youth hope at the beginning of the season. Um, so, because they actually didn't have a refund policy. Um, so there is one for programs and for trips. And they actually have um, also put in there where they would give credit rather than giving the money back. Um, because uh, there was actually quite quite the uproar um, around the the whole beginning of the youth group program. Uh, Bucky went over um, all the Owen Bell projects. Um, he went over the fact um, red, white, and blue is actually June thirtieth. I meant to me send you a message, Ray, um, with the rain date of the of the seventh. Um, and after the uh, KBA is actually going to do their second Saturday at Owen Bell as part of Run for Ryan um, uh, or kind of in, in, in coordination with um, and following that um, that's when the proposed dredging is supposed to um, the, the actual pond will be increased in width and around the edges as well as depth um, he also went over the splash pads um, and also um, the the proposed pavilion that will be over by Ra Ra's, um, which you know all all of the, I mean it, it's it's ter it's not great that we're going to lose the soccer field um, or the or the running trails in the back for the fall, but I think it'll it it's got to be done, and um, the track's going to eventually have to be ripped up anyway, so it's a perfect place to kind of let that stuff water out and because um, the track is the next thing on the on the hip parade because that's degraded quite a bit um, so um, things are moving um, they're actually talking about replacing some of the swings they actually have um, they pretty he's pretty sure he sh has enough funds to be able to replace those because they're in need of being replaced um, the spring programs are off and running. Uh, Suzanne Easterly had her soup and story. Um, there was spaces for 36 people and it was packed out again. It's one of their, their big things. In conjunction with um, public safety, uh, uh, one of our newer members that we placed is was big into biking. And so in coordination with um, our Killingly officers, we're going to have an, a first annual inaugural bike rodeo. Uh, Winchester, um, the the company Winchester, actually donated two bikes, and they're looking for get other donations from another local larger retailer in the in the region. Um, but they're looking to do a lot of um, skills stuff and and be able to give kids um, a lot of good stuff. Um, on, on a personal, on April vacation, they actually will have a day-to-day -day sign up of activities. Uh, Friday, um, in particular of April vacation, there's actually a movie and pizza for the kids. Um, 
reasonable um, fees for every day. Um, the drumming circles have been going really, really well. Um, they talked about the Jelly Bean Trail, which of course is of course the same day as our inaugural budget meeting, April Fool's Day. Um, it'll be open to Killingly residents. And on a personal, personal note, uh, my great nephew went is in kindergarten at KCS, and they took a field trip, and they actually set up workstations to, to tour the whole theater and took them around the stage and look at the sound and the costuming area and they all got, went home with a little goodie bag and one free ticket for a child if they come with a parent for the frozen junior performance in april um my great nephew was so excited he couldn't wait to go he thought it was this that weekend and my mom was very had to break the terrible news that he's gonna have to wait till april but the funny, the funny story that goes with, oh, and what's even cooler is in February, they're actually, there's a school in Providence of third and fourth graders that are gonna basically do what the kindergartners did and tour the local theater. Um, and we're actually, with the discussion actually went into when we get into the new Westfield Ave, how much bigger and, and that program could actually, you know, to inspire interest in the, in the arts. But, when when Dustin got got home and he showed that he went to the theater, so my mom looked at, oh, so you went to the theater? He goes, no, Grandma, it's the theater. So, <laughs> but so my that little generational, but so he so it's super super it's it's um, something they're actually looking forward to. Um, actually, some of our newer members. One of the newer members that we actually brought on um, had came up with this idea to invite the kids in. Um, she also was the one that sponsored the Cupidograms, which they thought wasn't going to go over real well. They actually had to get more people in to do to where they actually had people going out to sing Cupidograms today. Um, they actually ended up with 30 people going out to <laughs> sing Cupidograms. So, I mean. <laughs> It, the sky's the limit. I mean, we could invite the whole Killingly Chorus to go, go around and serenade people in the area. But so. Thank you, Ms. Barclay. So I had um, planning and zoning and um, housing authority. Um, both of the meetings were on the same day, so Jason attended. So next Tuesday, I also have two meetings at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the right ones, right? Yeah. Um, there was no pu there were no public hearings so um, it was just a workshop uh, looking at use tables on um, potentially combining three districts business park like industrial and professional business park into one um, district um, which would eliminate the minimum of 75 acres applying to um, the district um, this would be more in line with the rest of the zones within the community. They were also trying to define things that happen in enclosed structures. Can they happen um, outside in business areas like loading and unloading um, may occur in parking lots? Um, can light fleet maintenance be um, done outside, refueling, defining a right of way um, so they don't create um, landlocked parcels? Um, so this was just a draft, a legal, it'll go to legal before it goes to public hearing. Um, they want to make sure, are there anything industrial park that applies to business park so there won't be any overlaps. Um, trying to, should they define what a game preserve is because many of the um, zones say that it, um, you have to be a specific distance from a game preserve so they wanted to define what it is. Um, also defining the difference between a warehouse and a distribution center. And these are all up for final review um, in February. I just got one question. Um, talking about doing the, the maintenance outdoors and the uh, refueling. Um, are they looking into making sure whatever uh, containment areas are necessary from DEP uh, for doing anything like that? So that wasn't brought to discussion but they're they were saying that um 
many um, many of the businesses do that inside, but if there was a business, would they be able to do that? You know, refueling, that would be, well, that would be fuel pumps, like, so they didn't discuss uh, anything any containment areas around that, that would be my question if, okay. if they have anything that needs to be in a containment area if they're doing it outside how would, how would they contain any kind of spill okay I'll bring that up to them <coughs> anything further okay thank you very much moving on in the agenda next item up 17 a executive session we have nothing I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Mr. Grandelski. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? This meeting is adjourned.